following interview was conducted with Richard E. Grace, the Vice President for Student Services Emeritus for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, May the 29th, 2008 at Stewart Center in the television studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Tell us where you were born and your parents and siblings in the early years. All right. I was born in Chicago, Illinois. Okay. I'm an only child, 1930 born, uh, at the peak of the Depression, and um, uh, went to grade school and high school in uh, the south side of Chicago in sort of the steel mill district. Um, and uh, What was that like in high school and about your grade school? What was that? Tell us a little bit about that. Grade school was a parochial school at Dominican nuns. Uh, we didn't mess around very much. They had rulers, and there was, uh, there was plenty of discipline handed out. But I do have to tell you one thing. In about the third grade, I discovered that I really wanted to be the third grade teacher. And in the fourth grade, I figured out, nope, it's the fourth grade that I wanted to teach. And by the time I was in high school, I was the English teacher, the math teacher, and the chemistry teacher. And I knew... I knew from age seven or eight or nine uh, that this was one of the things that I needed to do in life. I, I found heroes, whether they were Dominican nuns or they were men teaching algebra and trigonometry, whatever it was, those were heroes. <laughs> Tell us, were there any student clubs when you were in high school, and what about athletics? Uh, I ran track okay. in high school, and I was president of the Student Service League, which would be the equivalent of Purdue student government here. Okay. And we were introduced to philanthropy. We, we probably didn't know that word, but we did all kinds of drives for paper and cans, and we thought we were doing good things for the high school and some beautification work around the high school. And it was a brand new school, uh, South Shore High School, and I discovered a favorite teacher, and we kept in touch for probably 40 years, I, my That's favorite nice. biology teacher at that point in time. So. It, uh, it was a love affair with uh, grade school and high school, I have okay. to tell you. And after high school, how did you happen to decide to come to Purdue? I assume you went, came to Purdue. I came directly. Um, two or three reasons. First of all, my parents said it was about the right distance. I was an only child, and they weren't going to quite release me uh, so easily. And um, uh, the high school uh, guidance counselors had urged me to study engineering. I was good in math. That was math, chemistry, sort of good in physics. But the, um, uh, the guidance counselors urged this upon me, but there was a stumbling block, and that is I was an out-of-state student to come to Indiana. And so I hustled up and took days' worth of, of some sort of tests uh, when I was a junior or a senior in high school, and I won a, a scholarship here that paid... Uh, the out-of-state fee. Now, the, the current people will laugh, the current students will laugh, because the tuition was $65 a semester, and the out-of-state fee was $100 a semester. So I was winning a scholarship for $200 a year, and it made the difference. My parents said, go. And so that's how I arrived here. Okay. Did you come by train or did you come by car? Um, when was this? When it, did you enter? I came by the Big Four station, the New York Central, I think, was the train, and I made many, many trips back and forth. Uh, cars were a luxury. Um, the only other thing that, that was remarkable is I was only 17 at this point in time, and Purdue uh, was at its peak enrollment for, for a decade uh, there with the uh, GI Bill. So I was thrust into classes as a 17-year-old with, uh, with captains and colonels from the Army and the Air Force who were 25 and 28 years old, and I was amazed at the competition. They weren't just kids like me, uh, but these were GIs, and they were determined to get an education. So it was, it was an awakening. Was this after the war that you entered? What year did you enter Purdue? I entered Purdue in 1947, okay, in August so of uh, 1947. So it was after the war then? After the war, but this was the peak of the GI enrollment. And at that point in time, the enrollment was almost 15,000. Seems small by comparison. But one of the things that then President Hubby had to contend with is as soon as the GIs left over about a five or six year period, 
the enrollment promptly dropped down to 10,000. And so they had ramped up uh, with temporary residence uh, halls, and they'd ramped up with extra faculty members. And I, I was away for a few years in there. I have no idea how they solved all of that, but they had a gigantic problem when the, the GIs finally left and we were back to Purdue University with the normal 17 and 18 year olds coming to uh, West Lafayette. Okay. What, uh, what was student life like? And what were some of your professors? Well, tell us a little about campus life when you were here. Well, first of all, I was a little overwhelmed. I was living in um, a Bunker Hill dormitory, which had, it was a big, big wooden dormitory that had been brought over from Grissom Air Force Base uh, as sort of. Um, extra material, I suppose, extra space. Um, it is. It was located right where Tarkington Hall is right now. Uh, we had three, uh, we had four large rooms. Uh, one was um, a study room and three were dormitories. And we had, I don't know, approximately 80 or 90 guys living together in one room uh, in a dormitory and we would we had double bunk beds and we had everybody sleeping head to toe and head to toe along the way so um, communicable diseases like colds didn't just go <laughs> through the place but uh, it was a um, it was a wonderful existence and my mother told me decades later that she cried after she left me <laughs> off at this at this particular barracks that we had for a uh, freshman dormitory what about eating facilities now, uh, we, take, we took our meals then in Cary West because we walked over to uh, Cary West and that was a wonderful arrangement. And in the middle of all of this, um, uh, my mother, bless her, met a uh, man in Chicago um, who said, I'm a member of Phi Gamma Delta fraternity and is your son going to Purdue? And she said, well, of course he is. And he said, I'll send his name in and we'll see if we get a match out of this. Well, the Fiji house is right at the corner of 6th and Russell Street, 7th and Russell Street, and uh, it was a good match because it was a block away from Cary West and a block away from where I was living, and um, I found the Fijis uh, in about January of my freshman year. So I had a, I had a good first semester before I uh, uh, pledged, and then the fun and games began after that. But in any event, that is campus been, life revved up. <laughs> yeah, it, it really did, and I have to tell you, Catherine, it's been 60 years since I was initiated. It will be 60 years later in a few months uh, from when I was initiated, and uh, I've been a chapter advisor uh, ever since. Ever since uh, that that time. Very good. Especially when I've been on the faculty. Uh, you know, I've, that's I've, that's I've good relationship. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. What about the buildings? There weren't as many buildings on campus then. Well, there weren't as many buildings. There weren't. There were about half the number of schools. Um, you know, management wasn't here. Technology wasn't here. Uh, nursing and health sciences weren't here. Uh, liberal arts wasn't here. Everything, all of the rest of that was sort of couched in a, a large school of science. Uh, but the before I get to buildings, let me tell you a size or a scale factoid, and that was that the schools of engineering uh, were about 60% of the entire campus. The enrollment uh, on the West Lafayette campus was 60% engineering students, mostly undergraduates, of course. Um, and while we have grown and grown steadily, uh, several thousand, um, we are now down to about 22% of the campus, mm. and that's because of all of the schools that have grown up, the academic uh, schools, now colleges, that have grown up um, around us. So it's been a steady decline in numbers, but a steady growth in quality uh, over the decades for the schools of engineering. Right, exactly. One of the buildings that I remember that isn't here is the old Fowler Hall. It was a separate building. It had. Um, first floor seating and balcony seating, because I'm sure it was a play shop or it was used for theater productions. And we took our freshman lectures there and we had a lecture from each one of the school heads in engineering. And Andre Potter would come over and give us a lecture on 
uh, that it really doesn't matter uh, which engineering you take as long as you find the right one. Well, e easy to say, but finding the right one made all the difference. <laughs> Uh, how did uh, you know you wanted to be a college professor? And what was the impact of Purdue education on you? Did well, you we reflect? talked a little bit about grade school right. and a little bit about high school. Well, the first thing that happened to me is I found more heroes right here at West Lafayette. Um, I found Richard Crowder in the English department. He was a hero. Uh, Frank Martin in the chemistry department. Um, I still use the factor label system when I'm stuck on a problem, and it's the, the method that Frank Martin devised for all of us in, in the 1940s. Um, John Bray in metallurgical engineering, uh, Andre Potter, I looked up to him. I didn't know him well, but I certainly looked up to him. And um, a, a, a sort of a, a wild card, I got to know Carl Lark Horowitz, who was head of the physics department. Um, when I was in my first or second year, I was a very traditional engineering student, but I started asking questions and finding my way around the campus, and I discovered that I was interested in some projects um, in physics uh, because they paid 50 cents an hour, and that was a princely sum at that point in time. So I became a, a, an hourly paid research assistant to Carl Lark Horowitz's research group when I was a junior. And he had a half a dozen graduate students and a couple of postdocs. Uh, Louise Roth was growing single crystals of germanium, and I didn't know what was going on, but I listened very carefully. And you know, I found out uh, that there was a lot more than teaching that was going on at this institution. There was something called discovery, and discovery got embedded in me in absolute terms. I learned about re research methods and techniques, and I heard about research contracts and government grants and publications, and I went to a few seminars where they served sherry, and I thought, wow, is that really a neat thing? So I was hooked on becoming a college professor, and it was all due to those heroes that I found at Purdue. Right. Good. Okay. Now, how about graduate education? And after you graduated from Purdue, then what was I next? I went off. Um, actually, there weren't very many places to uh, uh, study um, that had really good graduate education in engineering at that point in time. Uh, there was Caltech, of course, MIT, and Carnegie Institute of Technology. And uh, Carnegie Tech was a school very, very much like Purdue. Uh, it had placed great emphasis on science and engineering. And I went off to study metallurgical engineering. Didn't really know what I was getting into particularly, but I found a, a new set of heroes, and I found that research was the primary thing that went on at Discovery Research. As a matter of fact, in my entire uh, graduate program at Carnegie Tech, uh, none of the courses were taught during the day. All your entire day was devoted to your research assistantship and doing your projects, whatever, whatever they were. And all of the coursework was taught in the evening starting at 6.30, and we ran for an hour and a half, sometimes one course, sometimes two courses. So it was a full day, and at 8 o'clock the next morning you were doing the research lab. It, you kind of bootlegged your homework in, but nonetheless, uh, Interesting schedule. There were projects to be done, and um, uh, I finished a PhD in three calendar years. I was, uh, uh, and it was not exactly the norm, but it was um, approximately the norm for many of the students. So I had graduated from Purdue when I was 20, and I had just turned 23. I was uh, then 24, and I was hoping to make it, but by my 23rd birthday, but I missed. So I was 24 when I came back to Purdue. And how did, uh, now let's talk about Purdue, when your appointment and the initial reaction when you came back as faculty member versus well, student okay, and family. Well, okay, I came back here in uh, September uh, 1954, and I didn't have very many places 
to find a job at this point because there really weren't many departments that were looking for PhDs in metallurgical engineering. There were only a handful in the country at that point in time. Uh, but good things uh, had been happening over the decades. Metallurgical engineering had been a, a few courses taught within chemical engineering in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, there was a MET option of four or five courses um, in the 30s, and then metallurgical engineering became its own curriculum around 1940 or 41, uh, which is the program I went through. And then um, George Hawkins, George Hawkins, who was then the brand new dean of engineering in about 1953 or so, hired Reinhard Schumann from MIT to come in to head the division of metallurgical engineering, and I was Shu's first hire. So I got in on the ground floor. Um, several of the faculty didn't take to him exactly, so there was a, a turnover in faculty. And more importantly, uh, there was a, an element that, an event that happened in engineering education called the Grinter Report. This was a national report that had been agreed to by all of the engineering programs, all of the electricals, mechanicals, civils, chemicals. Um, it was written by Dr. Grinter from the University of Florida, and it revolutionized the way engineering education was, was going to be taught from that moment on. And the reason was simple. Um, during World War II, uh, the engineers clearly were great at production of war goods. But equally important, it was the scientists and the mathematicians that won the war. Um, the scientists and math majors around the world uh, created radar, uh, sonar, bomb sites. Mm -hmm. They created the atomic bomb out uh, in New Mexico. And it's clear that the engineers were not the key players in all of that. So for better or for worse, engineering education took a turn toward engineering science. And that was the key word for the next 10 or 20 years, uh, with some focus on engineering design as well. So curricula were all totally revamped. Uh, we placed much greater emphasis on math, physics, and chemistry. Uh, we taught the engineering courses with more mathematics than had been used before. And certain courses had to go by the wayside. Uh, they were the practical things that had been going on in the 30s and 40s. And uh, A.A. A. Potter had kept them. I'm sure he felt they were very important. But things like gas welding and electric welding and foundry and shop, graphics and descriptive geometry, um, they became things of the past. Um, another example, Bell Labs in uh, 1947 had created the transistor. And at that moment, um, diodes, vacuum tubes, they became, they dinosaur. went the way of the dinosaur and the dodo bird. So we had a clean slate. Um, if there is a regret that I have about all of that, is Hevel and Hall got torn down. Um, it was simply an old, old structure built in 1890, 95, and it was falling apart, and it would have been probably a million dollars in, in uh, 19, whatever, 58 or 1960 if we had kept it. Uh, so it got raised, and of course now we have this wonderful bell tower over here as a, as a permanent reminder. Uh, but we probably would have made a different decision today. It would be like University Hall, uh, but for the College of Engineering. Yeah, right. Great job. Let's move into the College of Engineering. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you were the start with the material science and metallurgical interim, and then you were the head. Let's work and, and okay. talk about how they've changed. Let me say the very first thing uh, that the faculty and I did. Um, well, first of all, I got to get promoted. So I, I started in uh, 1954. I was promoted. What building? Where were you located? We were in the Chemical and Metallurgical Engineering Building. Okay. This was a building that was built just before World War II, 1938, 39, 40. It was state of the art uh, when I was an undergraduate, and the departments were still combined. 
and we used to have holy wars over space, uh, two major players in the same building. You know the drill, I'm sure. Um, but I was uh, promoted to associate professor in 1958, full professor in 62, and head of the school in 65. And along this same period of time, there was another, another set of major events. Um, it was called contract research, and it became big time in engineering. Now, the science departments had had, had a, a better deal in all of this. Um, the Atomic Energy Commission, the National Science Foundation uh, were both founded in the late 40s, uh, NSF in 1950. Um, but ARPA, A-R-P-A, it was the organization uh, that was founded somewhere around 58, and they created what were called interdisciplinary laboratories, IDLs, to study material science. And this threw metallurgical engineering into the same bed, or perhaps the bedroom, with the physicists and the chemists and some of the other engineers. And none of us knew whether we liked this or didn't like it, and the thought of sharing facilities and having budgets with two or three departments participating. This was a zoo. This was really difficult times. And uh, there were players and there were non-players. Uh, one of my good friends in the uh, physics department uh, put up a sign. Uh, we were having a site review by this agency. And the sign read, IDL, go to hell. And uh, we were we didn't know what to do at this point in time. I think we had the head of the physics department take the sign down or something. But in any event, the first thing we did uh, when I became head was to change the name of the school uh, from metallurgical engineering alone to material science and metallurgical engineering. And of course, at that point, the science departments got a little bent out of shape because we were using the word science. And that, that tension was, lasted about a decade uh, maybe more, and so now we have the School of Materials Engineering, and it um, uh, looks like it's pretty stable, and it has wonderful space over in Armstrong Hall, but I know I'm getting way ahead of the story at this point. Okay. So I stayed in um, uh, doing my job to the best of my ability, but I have to say I was, I was really awakened to the possibility of interdisciplinary activities between departments. And that was pretty foreign uh, to Purdue point. University at that point in time. Uh, there were others like me who were happy to participate. We had Sunday seminars at each other's house, and we would each take a turn uh, trying to promote a field that would extend into, into others. Um, but it also was a difficult thing to penetrate. So I need to get on and tell you about the 1960s, because that, that was the most difficult time uh, that I have ever had at Purdue. First of all, the national picture. Uh, we had Civil Rights Acts of 1964. Uh, we had the Vietnam conflict get started around 63, 64, and it lasted seven, eight years. Um, we had John Kennedy shot. Bobby Kennedy shot. Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech, um, and he was shot four or five years after that. Um, a kind of a tangential thing, uh, oral contraceptives hit the market big time in uh, the middle 1960s, and the students questioned every bit of authority. Now, these were the, these were the boomers. These were the kids that were born right after World War II. They came to Purdue uh, as the first generation of boomers to hit the college. And what they did is they said, we don't like anything about these rules. We're changing the rules. You play by our rules. Um, war rules were, hell no, we don't go. Um, make love, not war. Uh, they moved out of the residence halls. They couldn't stand the rules and regulations there. They moved out of the fraternities. Uh, that's when all of the apartments became so popular in West Lafayette. And in those Vietnam conflict years, uh, we had an anti-technology movement 
created throughout the whole United States. Well, you can imagine how that applied to engineering at Purdue. We had enjoyed 1,500, sometimes 1,600 beginning engineering students uh, every year for 15 years or so from, say, 19, oh, 1954 or so when I first joined the faculty up through 67, 68. And then we started down, 100 or two students every year. Uh, we got down to 1,100. We were approaching 1,000 freshmen. Um, at that point in time, uh, Fred Hubdy, our beloved Fred Hubdy for 25 years, uh, he retired and Art Hansen came on board. And throughout all of this transition, there was the question of what was engineering going to do about all of this. Uh, the school heads took a dim view of any kind of change whatsoever. Um, we'll just tough it out. The students will come back eventually. Uh, another group said, we don't know anything about recruiting. That's for private schools, private universities. And so then Dean of Engineering Dick Grosh and I cooked up a plan called Interdisciplinary Engineering Studies. Um, it went by the acronym IDE. Uh, two quick tangents. The faculty did not take to IDE in, in large measure. Uh, the department heads took to it in even a smaller measure and promptly dubbed that IDE stood for I'll Decide Eventually. And others said that IDE was only three quarters of a good IDEA, a good idea. And so they said, this will never work. So President Hansen came over and had a little talk with the department heads and the Dean of Engineering and said, the rest of the university has noted your lack of, it, of freshman enrollment and we would like your positions reassigned to us because we are having growing enrollments and you're having a declining enrollments. And so he didn't quite say it this way, but the message we got is, you clowns better do something about this or I will reassign the positions in your budget within the next year or two. 1972 saw 927 freshmen enroll in freshman engineering at Purdue University. That has got to be the lowest number in 60 or 70 years. And it did catch our attention. So at that point in time, IDE came off the shelf big time. Uh, the faculty said, this sounds pretty good to us. So we think we can do it. Um, we invested time and energy creating non-traditional program titles. And this, this is where the first non-traditional programs became uh, throughout all of engineering. Things like architectural engineering, acoustical engineering. This is where biomedical engineering was first identified. Um, environmental engineering, uh, nuclear engineering, systems engineering. None of these None of these words were around at that point in time. Nor were there any courses or anything of that sort. Well, was. we okay. repackaged. Okay. We said we're going to do this for our own purposes. Now, we are going to create a new look for the School of Engineering to attract students to Purdue. We are going to let faculty have a little more leeway in, in doing their research and creating, bringing things from research into the classroom. But we wanted to do it with very small costs, uh, especially the increments. So we, we said, we are just going to repackage the current courses across school lines. Interdisciplinary is the word, um, uh, which, is, which was at that time a very foreign word to many people. So we would package up an environmental engineering course um, that would have courses in civil, and in chemical and in mechanical engineering, depending on whether it was water, uh, wastewater, or gas, or chemicals that um, were the issue. And uh, the same with acoustical, with biomedical engineering. There were, there were professors in electrical engineering that were champing to do work in biomedical engineering, and the system, the system didn't let them do it. So what we did is we created a whole new set of curricula 
uh, that were just on paper. There were, there were no faculties, no buildings. Uh, we had volunteer advisors. We probably had 100 advisors throughout uh, the engineering faculty. And slowly but surely, between the IDE program, the women in engineering program, and the minorities in engineering program, we made major, major efforts to recruit students uh, at this point in time. And uh, those programs brought another 100 students, and then 200 students a year, and then 300 students a year. And we were right back up to uh, 1,500 beginners. And we never had to give up any positions, at least that I know of. <laughs> now, there was a, another one of those sea changes in there. Uh, Dick Roche, uh, who was dean of engineering, promptly left in the middle of all this. Uh, I think he got a big promotion and went to RPI as president. And John Hancock, who was head of the School of Electrical Engineering, became Dean of Engineering. And uh, we continued for, oh, seven, eight, nine years uh, doing this, this new vineyard that Purdue had never, never explored. And uh, by the time, oh, by the time 1980 came along or thereabouts, uh, I had about Mm, 350 students enrolled in this. Uh, the enrollment's much lower now because the students found the original schools uh, more preferable eventually. Uh, but now uh, that IDE program is housed over in the new engineering education uh, department. And uh, it's still alive and well, uh, not quite the same size or scale it was. But at its time, um, I personally believe that that, the women in engineering program and the uh, minority engineering program saved the day uh, at Purdue Engineering for, uh, for the decade. And it was the only decade when uh, it wasn't quite as much fun to get up in the morning and come to work. The, the students were hellacious <laughs> for about seven or eight years. Mm. Then was freshman engineering. Talk, you want to talk a little about that? Well. Somewhere toward the end of about 1980, uh, Hal Amrine uh, was leaving, uh, was retiring from the uh, then Department of Freshman Engineering. And John Hancock said, you know all about this stuff, and you know about enrollment management, and you've been through all of this stuff. Why don't you take this one on for a few years and see if you like it? Well. I'm not the least bit shy, as you know, so I took this uh, department on and found out quickly uh, I had the largest counseling and guidance program in all of Purdue University. We had 1,500 beginners and another seven or 800 students that stayed over in the sophomore year. So on any given year, we had 2,300, 2,400 students uh, that were um, enrolled in then the Department of Freshman Engineering. And uh, we had several faculty members who were just great what they did. Dick McDowell organized all of the counseling and guidance programs, uh, got everybody registered and make sure they had that extra five minutes at the end of the registration period to talk about life's problems, if there were any. Uh, Bill LeBold was doing his research on um, making sure we had good retention in the schools of engineering, uh, making sure that the course, the kids took the right courses in the right sequence. And uh, two other jump starters uh, were Jane Daniels and the Women in Engineering program. Now, Jane wasn't the first. She was several along in that uh, uh, job. And Marion Blaylock in the uh, Minority in Engineering program. And we published papers and we won awards. We won awards at ASEE, and we won uh, awards from industry and from other societies for both the outstanding women in engineering programs in the United States as well as the minority engineering program. Became a national force, and there are uh, minority engineering programs uh, throughout colleges of engineering in the United States. And it, it, it became a it became a, another success story, if you'll let me brag just a little bit. I had no idea of what I was getting into, but I also saw 
uh, that there was a new force on the scene. You heard me report that the pill came on the market around 1965. Babies didn't get born. After the boomers, the birth rate dropped to half what the, what the boomer birth rate had been. And by 65, by 75, by 83, uh, there was going to be a huge uh, falling off in the number of freshmen that were going to college. This was not just Purdue, this was nationwide. Right. And so the question of enrollment management became very real, uh, both for the College of Engineering as well as for the, uh, the university as a whole. And somewhere in there, in that very time period, uh, Art Hansen uh, went off to um, a Texas A&M system. He went as chancellor of the system. Uh, John Hancock, the dean of engineering, went to industry. Henry Yang became dean of engineering. And Henry had more energy than all the rest of us put together at that point in time. Uh, teaching went up. Research went up. Government support for research went up. Uh, we were busier and happier than we had ever been. And we were working very hard against a very fragile enrollment pool because uh, we had been through this once before and we just couldn't believe that we were going to uh, uh, see a fall yeah, off right. in mm -hmm. freshman engineering enrollments. Mm -hmm. So one day, I have to tell you, one day over at the Lambert track, uh, my jogging buddy, uh, my good friend George McNelly, who was a dean of the School of Technology, the founding dean of the School of Technology, uh, said to me, uh, you know, Dick, the vice president for student services position just opened up um, a few weeks, a few months ago. And he said, I'd like to nominate you. You think you could handle anything like that? <laughs> I said, well, you know the odds of this. Uh, engineers may or may not fare out well in that particular position. But go ahead. And so uh, probably two days later, uh, then uh, provost, Tip Tyler, Vice President and Provost Barrow Tyler, called me and said, well, i, I got to have a resume if we're going to do anything, so get one over here in a hurry. And about two weeks after that, I was in Steve Baring's office having a two-hour interview in which I said very little but agreed with a lot of things that Steve Baring was saying. Um, in the meantime, I had done some other things. I had become a, a trustee down at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in uh, Florida and was very conversant with the, the national enrollment management picture by that point in time. And uh, uh, Dr. Baring knew that this was going to impact Purdue. And so he and I spent probably half the time talking about strategies by which we could move me into student services and we could redo uh, something to the admissions program that would ensure both the numbers and the quality. Well, I took that job in 1981 and stayed with it for uh, about seven years. I, I retired the first time in 1987. And I'm going to try to recite those student services uh, departments for you. First of all, Catherine, you're old enough to remember long division. Remember long division? And when you did it, you got something that was called the remainder. Well, student services grew up as, as a kind of remainder over about six presidents at Purdue University. Now, there, there was a core. Uh, there were things like admissions uh, and financial aid and the registrar, the dean of students office, uh, the co-rec the Student Hospital and Placement Service. A. A. Potter created the University Placement Service originally for engineering students. But that was a kind of a core uh, that had grown up over the decades, uh, loosely. But added to that, uh, I also had the responsibility for things like convos and lectures, uh, the three military uh, departments. I learned how to throw a snappy salute at one point in time. Um, uh, bands and Purdue musical organizations and an offbeat group called the Psychological 
testing services or something that I probably merged with the with the student health center. Uh, and so I wondered just a little bit about how to get my arms around this this thing called student services. And it was at that same time uh, when the minority engineering students were clamoring for their black cultural center, for their own identity. Uh, but what, uh, what the department heads and I did, um, essentially twofold. We started first to unify student services. The registrar went one way, uh, the bursar reported to Dr. Ford. Fred Ford and the bursar never talked to anybody in the registrar's office about anything. And there were issues, shall we say. Uh, the admissions office never talked to the academic deans. Uh, the student health service never talked to anybody. They were physicians and they only talked to themselves. And there were a few faculty members that wondered how they were ever going to get promoted because the band had faculty and the military departments had faculty. So this was a heterogeneous group. I have to tell you, this was a wide-ranging group. So we decided we would unify, and we adopted some goals. This was the, the era of goals and mission statements, but the, the thrust of the matter was we agreed uh, to recruit a better class of students for Purdue. Um, on the side, it was make sure we kept the enrollment up for the whole university, because this is when the national pool of 18-year-olds was very small. So we were going to recruit the very best students that we could. We were going to retain them through graduation. Uh, this was the beginnings of the retention efforts that have come on so strong. And the first, and the, the third thing we were going to do is to strengthen student life, strengthen those things that related to the cultural and the social and the religious and awareness of self for the young people and tolerance of others and all of the things that we had to do uh, to improve on the structure of social clubs, the fraternities, the sororities, the residence halls. Uh, about the only thing I didn't have student responsibility for was the residence halls. They had grown up in the uh, financial side of the house, and it was the largest residence hall system in the, in the country as well at that point in time. So we, we simply programmed each other to talk to each other within student services. Uh, sometimes we had departments move from one department to the next, and they would have cookies, morning cookies together, this was a little soft for the engineer here to figure out how we do it. We, we really needed to do it with numbers and computers, but some things we did with cookies, and, it, and they worked. Uh, the other thing that I really want to tell you about is this was the day, this was the decade of the customer service movement in America. Uh, the notion of customers became very apparent. Um, and no one had considered that a student applying to Purdue was our customer. Mm -hmm. And the parent that was going to pay thirty or forty thousand dollars worth of tuition was a customer of this institution. Uh, but beyond that, um, we would have departments, academic departments, make requests to the registrar's office for information. And they were customers. So. It turned out throughout the whole university, uh, we all were customers of one another's, and we mounted some quality control uh, initiatives. And Tom Templin, uh, who was an assistant vice president, and Marvin Schlatter, who was an assistant vice president at that time, uh, helped us revamp quality control, quality initiatives throughout student services. And I believe the one uh, that I'll single out that I am proudest of all is we created a, a new admission system that had not been done before. Uh, the goal was for students to apply online. This is the computers rearing their ugly heads. Um, we were moving away from the mainframes in the university and we're, we were looking at the 
issue of desktop computers. Now, engineering and science were a decade ahead of us on all of this, but student services was catching up. And we thought, why not have an online application, even though only the nerds might be able to apply, only the kids that knew how to run computers in high schools could apply. And then our group that was trying to do these quality improvements said to the financial aid office, why don't we do a, finan a financial aid estimate at the same time we do the admissions application, to which the financial people said, you can't do it that way. Well, maybe it took a month or two, and we figured out a way with our computers we figured out a way that Joyce Hall could come up with a preliminary financial aid estimate at the very same time the admissions office was sending out the offer for admission. And you can imagine the rest of the story. Um, admissions went up, the quality went up, the engineers in science and all of the people, all the people that use computers in the university were now getting kids that were computer savvy. And it was one of those grand success stories, another one of my success stories, that everybody else did the work. Yeah, now, I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm good on the front end, good on the ideas, but I have to give credit where credit is due. At the same time, another major initiative uh, was the Americans with Disabilities and FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Betty Sudarth, as registrar, led the charge on the um, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Betty Nelson, as Dean of Students, uh, also led the charge on Americans with Disabilities. And uh, we see their work, we see their handiwork throughout uh, the entire campus. So I came up for retirement. I was turning 65 years old in uh, 1995. and. Um, I said to my wife, I wonder what you do when you're retired, because I haven't given five minutes. I haven't had five minutes of any thought to this. And so uh, Steve Baring must have thought, wonder what Grace is going to do <laughs> in retirement. And he and I had a father-son talk about six months before I was due to retire. And I was telling him about these admissions initiatives, the Office of Admissions. We changed directors. Doug Christiansen was now the director of admissions. And I said to Steve, you know, the faculty has complained for 25, 35 years that I know of about CODOs. That's the change of degree objective process. And I said, we have never taken a student, we've never admitted a student to Purdue University in 125 years, except they declared their major when they were 17 years old. And so I said, you know why a third of them get it wrong, is they're 17 and they have absolutely no clue about what they want to study, and why don't we have a new academic unit in which undecided freshmen, undecided beginning freshmen, uh, can enroll at Purdue University and then make a a more fluid transfer, a planned transfer to the academic program of their choice. Here we go again. Um, the university wasn't quite ready for this. Uh, the faculty senate had a thousand questions about what this new unit was going to do and whether it would steal resources away from the academic schools. Uh, Bob Ringel was now the executive vice president and he paved the way with the other deans that this was a good thing. We would try it with just 150 students or so. Uh, this was, of course, the camel uh, with its head under the tent flap. And so 150 students or so turned into 250 and 350. And now I'm a little hazy, but there's about 12 or 1,300 students enrolled in this uh, undergraduate studies program. Right. And it's a program that really uh, was needed. We, there's no question uh, we have students who are uh, scholastically, academically, they're just not mature uh, to take on Purdue University. At, and to declare. And to declare a major. 
when they're, say, uh, September or October of their yeah. senior year in high school. Right. And so these students uh, are given special counseling. We offer an uh, education course in the College of Engineering. Uh, I even was nominated for one of the best teacher awards, and I declined in, in favor of a younger person over there in education. We really didn't know a lot about what we were doing. We went to other uh, other colleges and universities. Ohio State uh, is a leader in this regard. And what we did is we put together a program, and of course, uh, the engineer and me, we had to do the statistics right. So we had a control group. We matched every undecided student with another student in one of the academic schools randomly who had the same SAT scores and the same rank in class. Now, th this was a challenge for the registrar, but Betty Sue there did it. So we had a control group that we could measure semester by semester the retention of who was staying at Purdue and who was moving along through their third and fourth semester. And you know how the story turns out. The undecided students were a couple of points better than the average Purdue student, but we were giving them an enormous amount of counseling and guidance uh, throughout this program, and I don't know that that has held up today. But it was a success story, and there's simply no question uh, that that's what Purdue needed at uh, that point in time, and I'm glad to see that it's still going it's strong and probably growing a little bit. Right. Uh, yeah, that's a couple things you wanted to address is that over the decades, what are the forces that have shaped, say, Purdue and the Oh college? my, certainly, certainly all, let's do a little engineering. There is a system and its surroundings, and most things can be described by a system and surroundings. You put a student inside an engineering curriculum, and you have the student as the s system, and that's the surroundings. You take Purdue University as the system, and now you've got the world. You've got the United States. There's no question that the Congress of the United States, with things like the Civil Rights Act and Title IX, gender discrimination, most mostly in intercollegiate athletics, of course, but gender discrimination. As an aside, uh, the ratio, you, you know the ratio I'm going to refer to when I was an undergraduate student, was about 6.1 to 1. There were 6.1 women for every male on the campus. In the schools of engineering, the ratio was 1,000 men to every one woman enrolled in engineering. And now that's all changed. Um, the point is that these external forces, uh, mostly congressional in nature, uh, some from the Indiana General Assembly, from, from, some from things like computers coming into the scene. Technology. Technology has just changed the way Purdue does business. And so the, the, the most important piece of the story for me is that Purdue has caught up uh, my view, Purdue has caught up with its peer institutions in terms of not being compartmentalized by just the departments and just the schools of the university, but we're talking to each other. And we have not only interdisciplinary activities, uh, curriculum programs that are educationally sound, but um, in, in the new spirit of things, we have multidisciplinary research, uh, the, the Burke Nanotechnology programs, for example. Those are examples of current day activities that just couldn't have happened unless there were external forces, unless yeah. things changed outside Purdue and they were just, just brought into us. And some of the time we led, some of the time we followed, but that's we important, got it too. We, brought we, it we in, got yeah. the job done. Right. I would like to... Your uh, three wishes and... Yeah, I, I would like to, um, uh, to end this particular interview on three wishes. Okay. And they're near and dear to me. Uh, I've seen them operate over several decades at this point in time. Uh, my first wish is for the student body. Uh, my wish would be that every Purdue student would find a friend, would find a mentor on the Purdue faculty, 
and they would become lifelong friends. Uh, they would perhaps have a father-son, father-daughter relationship and in addition to the familial thing. But uh, I have 20 or 30 such students that I consider every bit uh, as much of the family and I may call them or they may call me and we spend an hour. Might not see each other for two or three years, but uh, we'd spend an hour or two. And I have a second wish and that's for the faculty in particular. And I wish that the faculty would seek out one or more students and mentor them and help them with their personal development. And if that means take them into their home or have a beer at Harry's or a cup of coffee at the sweet shop, whatever it is that they would mentor them and become friends or life for life. And my third wish is institutional. And I have seen the undergraduate studies program uh, fill a need uh, that this institution really uh, needed at its time. And my, my wish is a new college, a new administrative unit uh, called a freshman college that would expand the role of the undecided freshman in the freshman class. I think the time is right for perhaps a half of Purdue's freshman class to come in. Certainly all of the STEM students, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, even the Cranard students, even the management students would fit into that pool and uh, we would have just the best university uh, in the world. And those are my three wishes for how to strengthen Purdue. Good. Thank you, Dr. Grace. We appreciate that. Oh, thank, thank, thank you, you, Catherine, and hail my Purdue. <laughs> thank you, Brian. <laughs>